The next artist we're going to talk about is Kathy Colwitz. You can see her dates, 1867 to 1945. And she is a German artist. She is a primarily a printmaker and sculptor. And she wor works in all different kinds of prints. She does etchings, woodcuts, lithography, of course, combines the etching with dry point and aqua tint. And uh, you know, really, it's some very, very rich surfaces. Virtually all of her subject matter has to do with human suffering. And it's extremely emotional. Um, I will tell. I just thought I'd tell you how I feel about Kathy Colwitz's work. I think that she is the finest draftsperson of the 20th century. Um, I, and by draftsperson, obviously I can't say draftsman. Uh, by that I mean that in drawing, in graphic art such as printmaking, um, I can't think of anybody. You know that that surpasses her and only a few the rival her. Um, she just is, is an extremely strong artist. And this is just from the gut, but <laughs> this is just from the heart. Um, but this is, this is just an emotional response. I have uh, been to both of the Colwitz museums. There's one in Berlin. Unfortunately, the time I went to the one in Berlin, a lot of the artwork was in Washington, D.C. for an exhibition. <laughs> but I've been to the Kathy Colwitz Museum in Berlin, and I've also been to the Kathy Colwitz Museum in Cologne, in Cologne. Um, if you are looking for that one, uh, it's on the second floor. It looks like a shopping center, and you have to go up in the elevator uh, because we just had trouble finding the entrance. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful museum. And my reaction to her artwork, I put it this way, she takes your guts out and wrings them around and stuffs them back in. Obviously that's not literal, but they are very, very powerful works of art. And uh, they, they do affect the viewer emotionally, which is what they're supposed to do. We have a photograph here of her and a quotation she says, while I drew and wept along with the terrified children I was drawing, I really felt the burden I am bearing. It is my duty to voice the suffering of men, the never-ending sufferings heaped mountain high. And she does see this as a duty, as a kind of uh, mission that she has called uh, through her art um, to, to protest against the suffering uh, and the inhumanity. And of course her background will have something to do with this. She's born, uh, Colwitz is her married name. Uh, she's born Kathy Schmidt, Schmidt, excuse me. Uh, she's born Kathy Schmidt uh, in Konigsberg in East Prussia. Uh, now it is part of Russia. Of course some of these boundaries change back and forth, but she's definitely a German artist. Her family was very liberal. Um, they were involved with uh, socialist politics. Uh, her maternal grandfather was a nonconformist minister. He founded his own congregation. Uh, her, her father was a social activist, was involved with the Social Democratic Workers Party. And although he was a lawyer, he, uh, I, he, he decided to become a builder and a mason, you know, to be actually a worker rather than practice law in the very repressive uh, regime under Bismarck. Um, so strong social consciousness here. Her brother Conrad uh, was also a political and social activist and involved with the Social Democratic Workers Party. So, you know, her whole background is caring for uh, and trying to work for uh, political advancement for people who are poor and powerless, yeah. for the, the, uh, the proletariat, the, the, work, the, the poor working class. Um, now, one of the things we've heard over and over again is uh, whether a father uh, allows the daughter to get training 
or encourages the daughter. And in uh, the Colwitz family, they believed that uh, the daughter should develop their talents. And of course, for Kathy, uh, that was, this was her artistic talent. And so her father was very much behind her. Uh, one of the tragedies of her life, uh, very young, was when she was a child, her younger brother died. Uh, the theme of death, of course, is always around us, but when uh, something like that happens, a child dies when you are still a child, it undoubtedly has an effect. Um, her brother Conrad introduces her to the writings of Ibsen, Zola, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Marx, Goethe, and August Bebel, who wrote a book called Women and Socialism. And in this book, he calls for a society in which women are socially and economically independent, and women have full participation in public affairs. Uh, so this is, the, this is the kind of family that she's growing up with who really believes that uh, women and you know, poor workers uh, should have rights. Um, she can't go to the local Academy of Art because she's female. They don't let any women in. Uh, but her father arranged for her to have private lessons uh, with an engraver, a painter, uh, starting when she was about 14 years old. Kolwitz, when she's about 17 years old, 1884, uh, attends the Women's School of the Berlin Academy. And it's uh, believed that one of the reasons uh, her father wanted her to go to Berlin uh, was because uh, she was getting very interested in uh, uh, a young medical student, we'll hear about him, uh, Karl Kollwitz. And uh, he wanted her to further her career and not get, uh, uh, he, I, he didn't really think she could she'd get married, she should just have a career, I guess. Um, she spent a couple of years at the Munich School uh, for Women, art, uh, Munich School for Women Artists. In 1888 to 89, she was in Munich, uh, the uh, School for Women Artists. You'll notice that the artist schools are separated. Even if you have an art academy, uh, the women you know, have this little separate section, and uh, that was the way it was. Besides introducing her to all these interesting books, her brother Conrad introduces her to uh, Carl Kulwitz, who is a medical student, and he's also a socialist, that's how he knows him. Um, and they became engaged when she was 17 years old, uh, 1884. That's one of the reasons that her father wanted her to go to Berlin uh, to sort of you know, get her away from this uh, young man. Um, and as we'll hear, the, the father actually opposed it, and it'll be interesting to hear why. Um, they had a very long engagement, as you can see, uh, and they married in 1891. Now, the whole idea of how does marriage affect artists is, is very interesting. Her husband was a doctor in Berlin. He treated the poor working class patients on national health. And as we'll hear, this is important uh, for uh, Kolwitz's art. Now, her father opposed the marriage for a very interesting reason. He wanted his daughter to, to develop her artistic talents and have a professional career. And he thought that she could not be both an artist and a wife. That she became a wife, um, you know, her artistic career would suffer. As it turned out, this wasn't true. I'm sure the father was very happy. Um, Carl was one of these husbands who was very supportive of his wife's uh, artistic career. And it's probably true that if she had not married him, she would have had um, a much harder time because it was a long time before she was able to make any kind of money with her artwork. And being the wife of a doctor, she had a husband who was supporting her, and he was also supportive. When her son was born, her first son was born in 1892, son Hans, uh, Carl, her husband, helped out. Uh, he did a lot of the work so that, Kat, that Kathy Colwitz could work on her artwork. And then she had a second son who was born in 1896. Now, we said that, um, you know, with her husband actually treating 
the very poor people. Uh, this was, this had a strong effect on her. She already had uh, the sympathy for the poor workers. Well, now she was getting to know them. And we see that her subjects and her artwork very often come from this uh, poor working class. And she says, when I became acquainted with the difficulties and the tragedies under, underlying proletariat life, when I met the women who came to my husband for help, um, portraying them again and again, it opened a safety valve for me. It made life bearable. So she was very empathetic to, as you'll see, and, and her art reflects that, uh, very empathetic to the um, sufferings and the troubles of other people. Uh, she takes them, I know, sense on herself, and uh, that becomes a source for her artwork. Her first great success in art was a um, series of prints. She went to see a play by Gerhard Hauptmann. It was called The Weavers. And this was based on a historical event, um, an uprising of the linen hand weavers in 1844. Um, one of the books I was reading said it, they were caught between feudalism and the Industrial Revolution. So they were uh, being uh, oppressed, uh, didn't have any rights, and uh, were losing their work. Um, so this was the inspiration for Kathy Colwitz's first uh, great print series. She created many studies, and I do find sometimes different sources will give you just slightly different dates. I have 1893 to 98. I found one that said 92 to 97, uh, but certainly close in time, late 19th century. Um, and when she finished with it, or she worked on it for many years, there are many, many studies, many prints, uh, and then she finally ends up with the uh, six prints. She starts out with etching, uh, she moves to lithograph, and it turns out the first three in the series, not chronologically, but uh, when she was working on them, but uh, the, that were considered the first three in the series uh, are lithographs, and then the second three are etchings, and I will show you some of those. The themes are the themes that uh, concern her throughout her life, themes of poverty and of social justice, or rather the lack of social justice. Um, the first one in the series, uh, the series is called The Weaver's Revolt, and it's called Poverty, and I've also seen it sometimes called Famine. And as you can see, it's a very you know, dark print uh, with the, the poor mother, um, distraught, her head in her hands over the, probably the deathbed of this tiny little child. Um, they are so poor, they, they don't have food for their children, um, and just the devastation of that. And that's one of the things you'll see, that she often does have women and children in her work because she's showing how poverty, how oppression, how war affects the women and children who are so often the victims and are so often forgotten. I should say one thing about her prints, and I think the Peasants' War is even stronger this way. Often you can use those prints not just to illustrate the Weaver's Revolt, but as scenes of universal suffering. In other words, Although the uh, title refers to a historical event, the actual images, so, uh, many of them, not all of them, but uh, many of them can be uh, universalized, and I think this one certainly. Um, the second one, another lithograph, is death. And here's the march of the weavers. Uh, they are going out to protest, to you know, violently protest, as we'll see. They throw rocks. Um, and this is uh, the final print. This is an etching. 
uh, has elements of aquatin and dry point in it as well. Uh, it's known as Thrum or Storm. And uh, it's a very short title there. It's essentially, Storming the Gate, is some, it's sometimes called. Um, this is the attack on uh, the mill owner's house. And uh, they're, you know, obviously barred by this great uh, iron wrought gate. And, uh, you know, they come to protest and uh, I think they throw stones. I don't really know too much about the historical event. You see a woman in the foreground leaning over, very much foreshortened, picking up the paving stones to use as weapons. Her style at this point is realistic. Uh, extremely realistic. Um, it has strongly expressive elements in it, and the expressive elements, these are the elements that uh, really suggest em emotion and um, will become, in some of her other works, more abstract. She has this very interesting combination of realism uh, and expressive, uh, almost abstract elements, and yet they're, they, they come out of a strong realism, and we'll see this development, of course. Um, this is, I suppose, one of the most realistic of, of the works uh, because you have all of the details of the, uh, of course, the workers and uh, the gates. Uh, but as she moves on in her work, you will see uh, uh, less, less detail and just these bold, strong forms. This was exhibited in a, an exhibition called the Great Berlin Exhibit. It was an ex exhibition of art, and it caused a sensation. Um, it was, you know, just considered to be, I guess, extremely emotive. Uh, and in the, um, the jury proposed that it be given a gold medal. However, it wasn't, they weren't free to give the gold medal if the Kaiser said no. And uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II vetoed the medal. Um, he considered her art subversive. I guess it is. I mean, it's subversive against um, the inequities of uh, society and economics. And uh, he, of course, is one of the people who uh, profits by those inequities, so he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't want this to be shown. Um, and he, and, and this term got used, I guess, a number of times, uh, called her a gutter artist. And, uh, well, at any rate, I won't go into that, but um, this idea of, you know, you should only show pretty things. Don't show poverty and suffering. We don't want to see this. Then you're in the gutter. Art should be uplifting. Well, obviously, this is a different type of art. And it's not art to be beautiful in the sense of picturesque, although it is beautiful in an aesthetic sense, but at the same time, heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, <laughs> whatever word you want to use. Um, she, however, did get her gold medal uh, in the 1900 Dresden exhibition. Uh, the King of Saxony awarded her a gold medal, even if the Kaiser wouldn't. Probably uh, not because you know, he was so taken with her work, but uh, he had uh, someone who could uh, suggest and influence him uh, who was the uh, curator at the Gamalda Galleria, uh, Max Layers, who was the curator of prints and drawings, and uh, he presumably was the person who suggested uh, that uh, the uh, medal be awarded, and he had the influence so that it was. Her second and probably more famous uh, print series is based on the Peasants' War. So. What she's doing is taking historical events, but giving them a kind of universal significance. And in a way, this works pretty well. If she were to show, you know, contemporary, and she does at some point, but if she were to show at this point, say, a contemporary scene and say, ah, oh, the Kaiser is oppressing these people, um, she wouldn't get very far. <laughs> Uh, but when it's the Peasants' War, it's historical. And in fact, uh, she did get a commission to do this as uh, from a, a, I forget the name of the organization, but it was a history, history organization. Now, the Peasants' War was an uprising in Germany in 1525. Um, the peasants 
were often so badly treated. Uh, as you know, whoever owned the land could come and say, you know, take everything from them. Um, they were the workers, and they supported um, all of the nobility um, who was above them. This was the period, of course, of the Reformation in Germany, and uh, they started to hear things like uh, the priesthood of all believers. And it's thought that some of these ideas uh, of the Reformation may have been, at least in part, the catalyst for the Peasants' War. Ironically and horribly, uh, Martin Luther denounces the peasants. He said, they should stay in their place where God put them. And uh, he calls them some very nasty things and, and calls for any actions to be taken against them. And of course, what happens is they just break out um, with so much suffering, so much poverty, so much injustice. Um, they react violently and they start killing uh, landlords. They start killing the people who are above them and they pretty much go on a rampage. Um, there were people, whoever, who had sympathy for them because they had been so horribly treated. Uh, the very famous uh, sculptor Tilman Riemenschneider uh, was said to have had sympathy for the, uh, the peasants, um, which he was in prison for. Um, when the rebellion was put down, it was put down savagely. And these people were executed in horrible ways, including impaling. Um, and it was a long time, centuries, uh, before they, uh, they got any rights. 20th century, probably. Um, there was also a peasants' war in England in um, the late 14th century, uh, which was really put down by trickery. And they weren't violent. Those, they were simply saying, we should have some rights. Uh, we want the king to rule rather than the nob nobles. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, were, they were promised some of these things. And then um, it was, they were, instead, they were slaughtered arrested, what have you. Um, so here we see is this transition between what we call the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, uh, go together. Um, there is some awakening of the fact that even the lowliest people have some rights, or should have some rights. They don't have rights, but they should. Uh, as you know, that doesn't bear um, successful fruit until centuries later. And Colwitz is still fighting for the workers and fighting against the oppression of the workers, uh, even here in the early 20th century. So she uses the Peasants' War as the subject. And in this case, she has seven etchings, which were created between 1902 and 1908. And once again, I sometimes find just slightly varying dates on that. Um, the scenes are generally not uh, exact scenes of a historical event. They are imagined, but they take on that universal significance of uh, showing the oppression, showing the inhumanity, and in that way uh, calling for it uh, to end, uh, trying to, to expose it and, and, and uh, work against it. Once again, uh, she went over many, many, many different versions of these before she uh, decided on which ones would be the final version. Also, um, they're not in the order they were created. The, the first one was Outbreak, which we'll see, uh, is number five in the series. So let's take a look at them. And they do form a kind of sequence you know, of, of uh, oppression, breaking forth, and the aftermath. Um, the first one is plowing, or the plowman. Of course, all the titles are in German, and they're translated slightly differently. Um, I've seen reproductions of some of the 
uh, preliminary works, and she tried all different compositions, one where you were you know, looking off into the distance and uh, had strong diagonal movement. What she ends up with is so, it is so moving. Um, what you see is that the peasant, evidently his ox has died. The peasant is hooked, to the, is harnessed to the plow and is pulling the plow himself as though he were a beast of burden, as though he were an animal. Um, and, and an animal who, you know, you'd usually use oxen, they would be so much stronger and, and more able to do that work. It is such a strain that he is pulling, he is pulling, and he's almost parallel to the earth. Um, as you can see, the horizon comes, and uh, there's only that little, one little bump in the horizon <laughs> that indicates where he is. Uh, you know, he is really um, born down to the earth. And of course, as you probably know, the serfs were um, tied to the earth. Uh, the difference between a serf and a slave is pretty small. Uh, basically, a slave can be sold away. Uh, a serf cannot. Um, or if he is, he's, he's lost his livelihood. Um, and he wouldn't be sold away. Uh, a serf cannot be sold away. He can't. Uh, but he's tied to the earth and he has to produce generation after generation for the people who own the land, who are so-called so -called noblemen, landowners. <laughs>